Thanks so much, Callum. Thank you so much, Lucy, for, for sharing. And thank you for everyone who shared uh, this morning. It is, it's great. It's great. I love hearing from a church. And it's something that, that we've, you know, I've, I've personally missed. Um, I've missed church. I've missed uh, the, um, the time that we have together. And it's just so good, even in this uh, electronic sense, even via this medium, to still meet and share together. You know, it's, it's not 100% there, but it's better than nothing. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, last week, I shared about absolute intelligent design. And this whole month, we're sharing about the power of creation, because I especially want to uplift our almighty God. And when we belittle him, and when we belittle his power, it's, it's a dangerous thing. And I especially was very blessed, as we shared last week, regarding the documentary Dismantled, and how it was a scientific de deconstruction of the theory of evolution. And basing, rather than on, um, yeah, looking at observational science, good science, which is testable, uh, measurable, repeatable, and observable. Because, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're an evolutionist or a creationist, the evidence is the same. The evidence is all the same. So it's not a basis of science versus faith. The documentary shared about how it's history versus history and how, um, you know, where are we taking our history? Where are we taking our, our narrative from? Are we taking it from the Bible, a book which is thousands of years old that does not change? that explains an intelligent, creative God? Or are we taking it from 150 years ago? That does change, that every time there's a, there's a new bit of evidence, they change the whole theory. And, um, you know, what are we basing our, our beliefs on? And so this morning, I was gonna share with you five good reasons for a young earth, but I'm only going to share three, not because there's not more good reasons. In fact, there's many, 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 many great reasons or evidences for a young earth that we can trust, that we can believe in. But I wanted to dig a bit deeper today. I wanted to, to go down and, and not just do a, a shallow uh, talking point, but look at the facts, look at, look at different things. And I want to share with you three good reasons for a, for a young earth. And the first, and it's the best one is the Bible. And the reason why I say this is because very clearly the Bible shares uh, a lot of evidence um, regarding, you know, what, what happened. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And so here it, it shares the, the six days where God created um, uh, all, everything that we have on this earth and the seventh day where, where he rested. And then in Genesis 5, it gives a written account of Adam's line, of the genealogy from Adam to Abraham. And says, this is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. And after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. And if you keep on reading Genesis 5, you see a whole genealogy. And so one of the best reasons why I believe in a, in a uh, young earth is because the Bible gives a specific time period, a genealogy from Adam all the way to Abraham. And, and experts, um, biblical experts have taken those dates. They put it to our timeline into BC. And um, we can see uh, of a young earth from um, uh, around 4,000 BC, uh, give or take. And so we have this written genealogy. And some of you might be thinking, and it's very specific. It's very detailed, as you saw in this graph, uh, all the times where what age the, the father um, uh, had the son, begot the son, etc. And although when he died, it's very accurate. So we have this genealogy. Well, how reliable is it? Again, I want to encourage you 
to read uh, an article in AnswersInGenesis.org, did Moses write Genesis? And it looks at this very important question, or how reliable is this? Because there's been a lot of attacks on, on uh, Genesis, on especially the five books of the Bible. And, you know, there's even some theories about um, that it wasn't written by Moses, but written by many different authors, you know, author uh, J and, and author E and, and different priests, etc. And this article looks in that and looks into the evidence, both the biblical and also the, the surrounding evidence as well. And I believe it shows very clearly, yes, that, that Moses is the writer and that we can trust the writings of, of what he said and especially the genealogy, the timeline that he gives. Because it wasn't just Moses who, who wrote it down, but it was especially the Holy Spirit who was inspiring him, guiding him, leading him. Uh, as Peter says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For the prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this is, wasn't just uh, Moses' interpretation. This was the Holy Spirit. The Bible is an inspired book given uh, as, as to us especially. But again, one of the examples I love to look at, we believe in Jesus, that he was a, a real uh, person in history. And we believe that as, a, um, as a, a sinless being, that he didn't lie. So what did Jesus say? What did Jesus teach? What was his understanding? Well, he says in John 5, verse 46, if you believed Moses, specifically the five books of the Bible, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But he goes on even further. What did Jesus believe regarding the creation? Well, haven't you read, he replied. That at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So here Jesus specifies the beginning. The creator made them male and female. Jesus believed in a, in a young earth. And he goes on, he, he mentions it again, this time in a different concept, rather than the concept of marriage. He says in Mark 13, verse 19, because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. So again, uh, this, this seven days of creation at the beginning, we created, we created by God. This is not the only reason, but I believe this is the best reason. And we're going to go back to this, why it's so important. But I want to share two other reasons as well, two other good reasons why I believe in a young, in a young earth. Number two is soft tissue found in fossils. In 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer found soft, pliable tissue in a T. rex fossil that was supposedly 65 million years old. Now, when she first published this, shared this amazing discovery, it created shockwaves throughout the whole evolutionary um, society. And they couldn't accept it because it makes zero sense for there to be soft, pliable tissue found in a, a fossil that's supposed to be 65, at least 65 million years old. And so straight away, they started attacking her and they started attacking her research. They said that your sample has been compromised. Um, there's a, a, a micro, microbial biofilm, you know, any reason to say, actually, this is not the, the T-Rex that is, the, that is, this is an, an outward contamination. But she defended her research. And more than that, more and more researchers have found different types of soft tissue found in fossils that are supposedly even older than this T-Rex fossil. For example, in a duck-billed dinosaur fossil, they found blood vessels. And this fossil was supposed to be 90 million years old. In a Triassic uh, reptile, that's supposed to be 247 million years old, 
they found collagen proteins, different types of proteins in this um, very old uh, fossil, supposedly. And in uh, a fossil that's supposed to be 550 million years old, a beard worm, they found flexible tissue. Now, we can look at this and we, and we look at the evidence and we say, well, what does this mean? And it all depends on which, which history, which narrative we, we look at it. Dr. Mary said this herself, two alternatives for interpretation when, when you talk about her evidence that she found. Either the dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are, or maybe we don't know exactly how these things get preserved. Now, the only reason that they look at the second option is because it doesn't fit in with a long evolutionary narrative of millions, millions of years. But for me, the, when we look at a, a, a young earth narrative as the Bible teaches, then we say, well, the dinosaurs aren't as old as, as what we think they are. And, you know, it, it, it does make sense. And it's because so many people reject the Bible, they reject uh, the Bible narrative, that they just can't accept it. They, they, can't, they can't look at it. And even the Bible speaks about dinosaurs. In Job uh, 40, one of the oldest books in the Bible, it says, look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. Notice here, God says he created the dinosaurs and he made them with you. Same day, day six of creation, in which feeds on the grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in its muscles of its belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. So here it's, it's talking about a great dinosaur that potentially... Job could see in his day. Look at the behemoth. They called it the behemoth. Look at that, a, a dinosaur. Um, and, and see this creature that God made. Once again, referring to the all-powerful, creative, intelligent designer God. Number three, bent rock layers and, and polystrate trees. This is another reason why I believe in a young earth. If you go to the Grand Canyon, one of the seven wonders of the world, and I encourage you to go there. I've never been there myself, but I'm, I'm keen to see it for myself. You can see a whole, you can actually see 1,371 meters of exposed layers of rock, which show um, different types of stone. You've got the mauve uh, limestone, which, you know, again, scientists say were laid down over time 500 million years ago. Then you've got the red wall limestone, they say 300 million years. Then they've got the Kaibab um, limestone, 260 million years. So all these layers built over a long, long period of time, different limestones, different um, sandstones, shale, et cetera. You know, this is what experts uh, say happened over a long period of time. But then you see something in the, um, in the Grand Canyon that because it's, uh, so high above land, um, you actually see a, a plateau that is 700 uh, meters above the Eastern Canyons. This is over a long period of time. And you can see all the uh, different um, strata of the, of, the so of the stones, the limestone, etc. cetera. And it, and it travels over this long period, but there's a, um, a, a 700 meter difference between the plateau and the Eastern Canyons. And they've got in between East uh, Kaibab monocline. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I never say things right when I don't understand them. But you can see evidence of tremendous, and I apologize that this picture is uh, pixelated. It's not very high resolution. But you can see the stone turning and bending in, in tremendous angle. So you see on the left there, it's going straight, straight, straight. It goes down, then it goes up in 45 degrees angle. And then you've got a 90 degree angle where the, um, the plateau shifted, moved up higher than the, than the Eastern um, Canyon. But you see with this rock, now this is supposedly rock that is, um, you know, over 400 uh, million years solidified solid rock. And we know with, for example, concrete, 
that when you try and, and shift concrete, when it's already hardened and dry, what does it do? It breaks, it cracks. You see specific stress uh, cracks and, and, and um, tension. You know, scientists can see these things. But with this specific rock, you can see that it's bent, not broken. So the whole understanding, the whole theory that these rocks are, are placed, or these layers are placed over 500 million years, just doesn't fit with this evidence that these rocks must have came down together and moved in a, in a, in a short period of time while they were still pliable, while they were still malleable. Now, some um, scientists, you know, they don't look at that. They say it was because of the heat. There was heat involved that turned the rocks back into like plastic where they could move again. But the thing is, we don't see the recrystallization and the um, metamorphic stones of what would happen if heat was involved in this whole process. All of this is sedimentary stone. But instead of it happening over a short, over a long period of time, it happened over a short period of time, potentially, as the Bible says, through a global disaster, such as the global flood. And the second part of this, and again, this oh, speaks so much, and I love these pictures, and there's so many of them, of it's called polystrat trees. And these trees go over one, uh, more than one, or one, at least one strata. And these, again, scientists say that the layers between the rocks happen over a long period of time, sometimes millions of years. You see that one on the left? That's uh, a coal stream where this tree, this fossilized tree, goes from the, the coal seam to the, to the next layer and above. And again, the strata are supposed to be millions of years. Now, how does a living tree last? For, for millions of years as one layer goes up to, to another layer. It just doesn't fit. The evidence doesn't fit their narrative. And again, this shows that these things, this uh, layers happened very quickly rather than long. Whether those trees um, were growing there and then were covered by, by soil and mud and then solidified into stone, etc or whether they floated there during the, um, during the flood uh, vertically and then set there, you know, it just, again, it shows the, um, the evidence shows this couldn't have happened over a long period of time. And it's not just in one, two places like a local flood. Uh, you're looking at this map and you're saying, Paul, this is a very simple map. And it is a very simple map, but this map took me over an hour to research and find because I wanted to find the different places where polystrat trees or fossils were found, specifically trees, not every type of polystrat um, fossil. And you can see them all across uh, North America from Alaska to Tennessee to Wyoming to um, even in Canada. And then you can see it in Europe, you see it in England, you see it in France, you see it in Germany. These are where polystrat trees are found. And then you can even find one in, in Queensland. And so it wasn't just in one specific area. Now, I, I, as I said, I spent an hour and um, I, said, I said, I've got to finish this sermon. I've got to, I've got to keep on going. Um, but I know there's other places as well. So this is only just what I've been able to find and research within an hour. But it just shows, again, this wasn't localized, that, that this catastrophe, this global flood, um, showed through polystrat trees um, in you know, it, again, it shows the evidence. Now, you might be thinking, well, Pastor Paul, I've heard about carbon dating. What about carbon dating? Doesn't carbon dating totally uh, rule out a young earth or a biblical principle of a young earth? And I'll be honest, I didn't know a lot about carbon dating uh, before this. And I was afraid, to be honest. I was afraid, you know, is this going to contradict with what I believe? So I dug into it. I looked into it. And I, now I understand it. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in this area by no means. But let me explain um, as simply as I can how it all works. So there, there are especially two elements, um, carbon-12, which is a common element, and carbon-14, which is a, a radioactive element. And this radioactive element, as it 
decays, it emits radiation, which scientists can measure. And living organisms absorb, especially these two uh, elements or, or atoms um, together. And at death, so throughout the lifetime, they're absorbing both carbon-12 and carbon-14. And at death, they stop uh, absorbing these um, carbon elements. But carbon-14, as it's radioactive, it has a half-life. As it's decaying, as it's emitting radiation, it's, um, it's, it has a half-life. So the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And so at death, an animal will have 100% carbon-14, but then 5,730 years later, it will only have half of that. And then another 5,730 years, it will only have another half of what's left over. And so carbon dating, they measure the carbon-14, they measure it in the bones, in the, in the animal, et cetera. And they can determine how much carbon-14 is left in those fossils. But because of the half-life of carbon-14, it's only good for measuring up to 100,000, a maximum of 100,000 years. Because after 100,000 years, uh, all that half-life, the, 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 the element would go down uh, so where it's unmeasurable anymore. Where it's unmeasurable anymore. And so it's got a maximum uh, measure of 100,000 years. So if there's a, a fossil or anything that is over 100,000 years, it will have 0% carbon-14. Now they know the measure, they can measure the carbon-14 and that's good. They can measure how much it's got now, but they don't know what it had when it died. So they measure it against carbon-12, which is a quantum element, which is not radioactive, which is always the same amount that it died will always have the same, um, that same element. And so they make a huge assumption with this um, type of dating technique where the ratio of um, carbon-14 and carbon-12 is always the same. More than that, it's at an equilibrium where it, where it doesn't change. And the ratio is um, one carbon 14 to one trillion carbon 12. And so they can measure it, uh, how much is in ratio and the half-life. But there's, there's a big problem with this uh, assumption. The ratio is not in equilibrium and it's not constant. It's not constant. And you can look into this again, uh, you look on answers in Genesis creation.com. You see uh, this fantastic article that explains this much better than I can do. And here's the real kicker. This article um, published in 2019 took samples, again, dinosaur samples that are um, from 10, 10 different dinosaur samples from all different parts of the world. And they measured, or they tried to measure the carbon-14. Now, if these fossils were supposedly over um, 100,000 years old, there would be absolutely zero carbon-14 left. But the researchers found that not only dinosaurs, but Neanderthal, um, mammoth, wood, coal, even diamonds, which are supposedly billions of years old, they found carbon-14 in these samples. And more than that, I didn't, I didn't explain this, but with the, the ratio um, not being constant, things such as the decreasing um, magnetic field of the Earth. In the last uh, 170 years, the magnetic field of the Earth has been uh, reduced by at least 10%. And these affect the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. More than that, when we understand, um, as the Bible says, a global flood, where potentially the pre-flood world had a lot more carbon um, than, than we have now, it affects these ratios. And so the years that you're seeing here can actually be stated 10 times more than the actual years according, because of this ratio is not in equilibrium and um, you know, is subject to, to change. So the big question is, what's the big deal? Why does this matter? 
you know, Paul, you're talking about science. Well, why does, why does all this matter? The Bible says very clearly regarding God, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they were created and have their being. This is what the Bible says about God, that he created the world and that he is worthy of all our praise. And when people say, no, it didn't happen as God said, it didn't happen as, as the Bible teaches, it happened in this way, they're calling God a liar. They're calling God a liar. And friends, God is, is not a liar. More than that, when we, there's a thing called gap theory. It's again when Christians try and fit the evolutionary narrative to the Bible, where they take the days of creation and saying, well, instead of seven literal days that God created the earth, there's gaps in between those days. And so there could be millions of years in between those days. This whole gap theory destroys salvation. And I talked about this at the start of the year, but think about it. Think about it logically. It's got to fit, friends. If when Christ created the world, you, many people say, you know, I believe that God as an intelligent being created the world, but then, you know, through evolution, but the problem with that is we believe that in six days, God created man and animals. And then Adam and Eve, through their choice, chose to eat the fruit that God said not to eat, to, eat from and brought sin into this world. And with sin brought death, sickness, and disease. And the problem with this gap theory is that if there's millions of years between dinosaurs and humans, then, um, then death existed for millions of years before sin. And they found cancer in dinosaur bones. So this death sickness existed before humans, before the choice of Adam and Eve. And it just doesn't fit. It doesn't make logical sense. But, but because when you throw out sin, what do you throw out? You throw out the Savior. What's the need of Jesus? What's the need of a Savior if sin existed even before uh, humans um, existed? You know, what, what difference? But more than that, there's a beautiful picture here. You didn't evolve from ape like creatures, you were created in the image of God. I want to get, once again, the dismantled documentary just shares the amount of information needed, the difference from a chimpanzee to a human, and the time that supposedly scientists say 13.7 billion years is not enough for, in, in regards to probability, for random mutations to be advantageous, to add enough information from chimpanzees to humans. It's just not enough time. The probabilities are not there. You didn't evolve from this. More than that, you are exceedingly valuable. This God who created us, who formed us, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves us and he's got a plan for us. And I want to especially share that with you next week with Nathan, who's going to help me, um, as we look at purpose and cause and especially the existence of God. But in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, and more than that, I always want to do it and have a look at what the Bible says regarding this. And this is why, again, it's so important. If we throw out parts of the Bible, it's like we're throwing out the whole Bible, because the Bible's not like a buffet. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 14 to 17. Listen to this. 
It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, we can trust God's word. We can trust exactly what it says regarding the creator and how we were created, how we were created. And if we can trust the past of what the Bible says, we can definitely trust the future. You can trust God. We know what the Bible says in regards and I want to speak about this more in the future as well, about the more things that we can expect to happen. Many people believe that through science, we're going to become a utopian society where there's going to be just absolute perfection. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that as we get closer and closer to the end of time, closer and closer to when Jesus comes, there's going to be more trouble, more problems. But here's the thing. Again, I want to remind you, you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be worried. Now is the time to build your relationship with God, to trust him fully. We might not have all the answers. We, we don't have all the answers. That's where faith comes in, where we can't answer everything. We still believe in what Jesus Christ said. We still believe in salvation. We still believe in who God is and how much he loves us. And more than that, the plans and purposes that he has for you and for me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, I just want to praise you that you are the awesome and magnificent creator, that there is nothing too hard for you, Lord. And when we in our human minds try and, try and bring excuses or to belittle you, Lord, forgive us for that. Increase our faith to look at the evidence that we see in the world and see the almighty, powerful God and exactly that we can trust your word. We can trust you. And so, Lord, just help us as a people through this time to know that we can trust you, to know that we don't need to be fearful or worried, to know that through all the stresses, all the worries, all the things that we are experiencing in our world today, that you are God, that you are good, and that you have a plan even in this. So, Lord, help us to be that people that reflects you well, that shines a light in the darkness. Help us to bring hope where there is hopelessness. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.